Well, hello there. Welcome to the National Weather Service here in Cleveland, Ohio. We are about to take you on a journey to see how weather buoys help meteorologists observe the conditions on a body of water and then generate a forecast for future conditions. As you can see over my shoulder, there are several types of buoys. Some buoys are anchored by a heavy chain and a large block of concrete at the bottom of the lake or the ocean. Other buoys are free to drift about with the currents. And yet other buoys can self-propel themselves like a torpedo. The one thing all of the buoys have in common is that they all take some type of measurement of the conditions around the buoy to give meteorologists and researchers detailed information. So let's dig a bit deeper into why buoys were developed and how they can help us make better marine forecasts. We will also take a look at the buoys and how they help communities make better decisions on protecting our water supply for drinking water. The National Weather Service offices located near large bodies of water like the oceans, Gulf of Mexico, and the Great Lakes have used buoy data extensively to improve forecasts for wind and wave conditions. The development and use of buoys has a long-standing history, so let's take a few moments to see why and how they were developed. A pioneer, engineer, public servant, and author, Grover Cleveland Lanning, was born September 12, 1888 in Bremen, Germany. He devoted his life to aviation and as part of the war effort, worked with the Navy to develop an aircraft. After the war, Grover concentrated on aircraft that could be used on bodies of water. The first known proposal for surface weather observations at sea occurred in connection with aviation in August 1927, when Grover Leaning stated that weather stations along the ocean couple with the development of the seaplane to have an equally long range would result in regular ocean flights within 10 years. As time went on, World War II started and the Germans saw a need for weather observations over the northern Atlantic Ocean. There was no way to place a human in the middle of the ocean, so they developed a way to put automated weather observation systems on buoys in the middle of the ocean. According to the Royal Meteorological Society article written in their publication, during World War II, the German Navy deployed weather buoys called in German Wetterfunkgerät, or Automated Weather Stations, at 15 fixed positions in the North Atlantic and Barents Sea. They were launched from U-boats and held in place by an anchor cable. Overall height of the body was 35 feet of which most was underwater, and a mass that extended upward to about 30 feet above the water containing all the weather instruments. Data that included air and water temperature, atmospheric pressure, and relative humidity were transmitted four times a day. When the batteries ran down after about eight to ten weeks, the buoy self-destructed. The Royal Meteorological Society article also stated in 1932 a Finnish meteorologist, Vilho Vasela, was the first to suggest that meteorological data could be transmitted by radio from remote sites. Vilho's work with weather balloon instruments helped him to realize that the data from buoys could be transmitted the same way his weather balloon transmitter worked using batteries for power. 
he imagined that the buoy would record and transmit weather data like air pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind for extended periods. Anticipating that in the event of war, meteorological observations from the North Atlantic and continuous land areas, crucial for predicting weather patterns that affect Europe, would no longer be available. German meteorological authorities became actively involved with the development of automatic weather stations. Two types of automated weather stations were developed, one for use at sea and the other on land. Research workers at the Griefswald Marine Observatory on the Baltic suggested using floating buoys. And so, the use of weather buoys was born and have been used throughout the world ever since. So, what are buoys and how does the weather information the buoy creates reach us in modern times? Weather buoys are simply like a small boat that floats on top of the water. Yes, there are other types of buoys that can move about on their own from one location to another, and yet others that just drift with the water currents. But we will take a look at a basic weather buoy so we can understand how they work. In this picture, you can see that the buoy is floating on top of the water with a long chain attached at the bottom. Sometimes the chain may contain instruments that measure the movement of water under the surface. The chain is attached to a large block of concrete or some other device at the bottom of a lake or the ocean. This helps to keep the buoy from floating away. The buoy can measure wave heights as the water around it rises and falls. Waves are measured from the highest point of the wave to the lowest point. This is like measuring the distance between the peak of a mountain to the bottom of a valley. Inside the buoy itself is where the computer, batteries, and compass are stored. The buoy can turn and never faces the same direction. So the compass tells the buoy what direction the buoy is facing so we can get the direction of the wind. Wind is measured by the two wind vanes you see at the very top of the tower on the buoy. There are little fan blades that spin to measure the wind speed in front of the wind vane. Other weather sensors like air temperature, humidity, and pressure are measured on the tower as well. Imagine this little buoy in the middle of one of the Great Lakes or even in the ocean where waves are higher than a two-story house. The buoy has to be built really strong so it can survive the horrible conditions on the open sea. Sometimes conditions can be so bad, the buoy may break loose from the anchor chain and drift to shore. Ice on the Great Lakes would crush a buoy, and that is why the buoys are removed late in the year before ice begins to develop. The buoys are then returned in the spring for another season on the water. Buoys can record many different pieces of information about the water they are floating on and the air above it. Some buoys are used to measure conditions to help scientists get a better understanding of how the oceans play a role in our ever-changing climate. You may have heard of El Nino and La Nina. When these two conditions develop over the Pacific Ocean just south of the equator and just west of South America, the whole world can be affected. Major changes in weather patterns develop, and depending on whether El Nino or La Nina is present, significant droughts or flooding can occur. Many more conditions change because of El Nino and La Nina. You can do a search online for this information to learn more about them. 
The buoys help scientists predict when these changes will occur so governments around the world can prepare for these events. Buoys also detect tsunamis and help scientists warn people along the ocean coast that a possible tsunami is headed their way. The buoy can detect the wave as it is headed toward shore. As we heard in the history of buoys, data was sent to shore by radio. Modern buoys send the data up to satellites and then back to Earth at receiving stations that use satellite dishes. Here we can see a brief example of how buoys measure the water temperature and the information we get from the buoys. When the buoys measure warmer than normal water west of South America, shown in red in the bottom picture, we have El Nino. However, when water temperatures are colder than normal, we have La Nina. This is why buoys are very important on the oceans, and scientists can measure these changes in the water temperature. Small drifting buoys are deployed by ship or by airplanes into the ocean. These buoys are designed to drift with the currents to help scientists learn which way the rivers of water on the ocean are moving. Have you ever wondered how an object thrown into the ocean ends up in another part of the world years later? The ocean currents move the object across the water, and that is exactly what these buoys are detecting. Notice that the United States is not the only country that is using these buoys. On August 10, 2020, there were 1,561 buoys drifting in the waters around the world. Here we see a map of buoys placed at a specific locations around the world. Notice the several gray squares in the middle of the map that are lined up along the equator. These buoys were placed in this location to help with getting a better understanding of the effects of El Nino and La Nina that we just talked about. The red triangles are the locations of the DART buoys, which stands for Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis. They are placed just offshore to detect the large waves headed towards the coast. Buoys are also placed in the ocean to make measurements of conditions ahead of tropical storms and hurricanes. The information helps meteorologists get a better understanding of how the tropical weather systems may change as they head toward land. In 1900, a major hurricane hit Galveston, Texas. Weather observers at the time knew something bad was going to happen, but they had no way to tell how bad. Thanks to buoys and satellite information, meteorologists have a, a much better understanding of the strength of hurricanes well before they reach a coast. The combination of real-time weather observations from the ocean and computers that create hurricane track forecasts have given meteorologists the ability to alert people along the coast to evacuate and be safe. Data from buoys are sent to satellites high above the Earth's surface. The satellite then sends the data down to receiving stations on the ground. The information is then sent out to many different places including the National Weather Service. Buoys not only provide beneficial weather information for people, but they also are a perfect spot for marine mammals to climb out of the water and sun themselves on a nice sunny day. As you just saw, there is some history behind buoys and why they were put into the water in the first place. But let's go out and visit some places where you may experience what the buoys are telling the meteorologists. One of those places is at the beach. 
So grab your life jacket and beach toys and let's head down to the beach and enjoy some sunshine and water. back out here on the water now and I just wanted to give you a little idea of what we're experiencing as far as uh, what buoys can help us out with. As you can see in my hand here is a little bit of uh, good old Lake Erie water and the buoys can help us uh, monitor the water so that we can see what's going on as far as water quality and also the, uh, the waves and the winds. You know, and the other thing is too, this water may someday end up in our tap water, which ends up in our homes. So that's why it's so important that these buoys are out there helping us to monitor what's going on. And the other thing is too, you know, we see a calm glass of water compared to the little bit of uh, wave action that we're seeing today. That can go from a nice, uh, beautiful day like we're experiencing today, all the way up to a major storm where waves are just rolling on the beach right behind me. And also, the buoys are important to people that like to go windsurfing or canoeing or kayaking. They're out here too when the water is nice and they enjoy the, the beautiful weather. But when it's really rough, you know, the windsurfers like to try and hit those waves and they want the perfect condition to make sure that they're out there having a good time. But they want to also do it safely. And the buoys will show what the wave heights are and the wind speeds are. And they can look at that well before they even get out here to see if the conditions are good. And the other problem is a lot of people come from several miles away to go boating, like southern Ohio, southern Pennsylvania to Lake Erie. And, you know, they don't want to make that four hour drive just to find out that it's way too rough out there. So they can check the buoys online and the Coast Guard even has a, a really nice uh, app that you can look at, so look it up, and you can see what the buoys are showing. So the other thing is too, we'll talk about it more later once we get out on the beach, is rip currents. We get this, these waves that roll onto the shoreline, and when they hit the shore, they, they break onto the beach. So sometimes you get areas where the, the beach is, just the, the water is uh, real shallow before you get to the beach and the water piles up on the beach and there's no place to go. But I'll show you that more later once we get to the beach. So I hope you're out there on the beach and enjoying it and having a wonderful day just like we are. Here we are on the shores of uh, good old Lake Erie here in Metro Ohio, Better Heaven Beach. And as you can see, it's a beautiful day. So I hope you brought your toys out to enjoy the beach if you decide to go out. Now one thing I wanted to point out, you know, we were out on the boat uh, the other day and I mentioned about rip currents and what happens is you see these waves coming in and hitting the shore. Normally when the waves are very high they can pile up along the shoreline here and cause the waves to build up and pile up behind the just offshore. And then as the water piles up here it has to go back out into the lake creating a current. Sometimes you can, if you're swimming you can get caught in those currents and it'll take you out into the water. Now you notice right behind me here is a lighthouse. There's a pier. A lot of times the water will pile up behind that pier and then work its way down along the pier, creating a current forcing you to drift outward. Those are what we call rip currents. That's why it's, it's critical we have buoys out on the lake to let us know what the winds and waves are so we can detect when these currents may develop. And we can put headlines out for you to let you know that there's a possibility. Now the other thing is too, that we have, as far as the amount of water here in the Great Lakes, about 84% of the water here in North America, right here in the Great Lakes, is fresh water. And about 21% of the, of the water across the entire world is fresh water. And that's all based on statistics by the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, the other thing is too, I mentioned the lighthouse behind us. The National Weather Service has wind equipment on the top of that lighthouse. It lets us know what the winds are doing on the, or near the lake. But the thing is, it doesn't give us the full details like buoys. It doesn't tell us what the water temperature is, which is critical for us when we want to go swimming in the water or people who want to go fishing. And it also doesn't tell us what the waves are doing. So that's why buoys are important. 
to make sure that it's safe for boaters and, and the shipmasters and the captains on these large ships that go across the Great Lakes and around the world. Hi again, we're back for another part of our little journey out on Lake Erie. As you notice behind me, you can see that the shore is uh, quite eroded. We've lost uh, quite a bit of shoreline because of the high waves. That's one thing we try to do with the buoy data, is look at the buoys to see how strong the winds are and how big the waves are, because as the uh, winds blow the, the water up on shore, it causes massive erosion like you see here behind me. The other areas that are affected are towns that are right along the lake, and also marinas uh, can be uh, damaged uh, quite heavily because of the large wave action. And unfortunately, because of the high water levels now, we are losing a lot of our lakeshore as uh, time goes by. One last note for you, if you notice, we're out here on the boat on good old Lake Erie. We've got our life jackets on. Make sure you always wear a life jacket when you're near the water because you get in the water, you obviously aren't gonna float for very long because eventually you get tired from swimming. So make sure you wear that life jacket. It is cool to wear one. Welcome back. Now do you see why it is important for all of the people that enjoy life on the water every day to have information from the buoys to make their day a lot more fun? Don't forget, not only do we use the water for fun, a lot of the things that you eat, wear, or use every day probably arrive from the factory to your house on a ship. Shipmasters, or in other words, captains, rely heavily on weather buoys to make sure their trip through the Great Lakes or the, even the oceans of the world are safe. And they want to make sure all of the goods they are carrying on the ship arrive safely to their destination. Ships that travel on water all around the world carry billions of dollars worth of goods to and from countries every day. And as meteorologists, it is our job to help the shipmasters do their job safely as well. But let's take a look at another video that will show you how weather, the weather buoys help city leaders and water plant operators maintain safe drinking water. You see, when the water on Lake Erie warms up in the summer, algae starts to form, and some of that algae can make us sick if we drink it or even touch it. So let's have a look. In 2006, hypoxic water uh, reached our water intakes and got into our plants before we really knew what was happening. And it was an occasion where they weren't able to treat this water quickly enough so that it was sent out into the service district. So they had customers and people within their communities who were having yellow water coming through their pipes. They had to flush out the system. They had to pay overtime to employees, go to extremes to try to remedy the problem. It was a, a big shift in operations and I created a lot of negative uh, PR for them. And it cost uh, the city of Cleveland a lot of money and a lot of man hours. Half of the people in Ohio that use Lake Erie water are actually Cleveland water customers. It woke us up to needing to understand what just happened and how do we prevent this from happening again. They took actions to try to understand why these events were happening, to try to prepare for them, be able to predict them. And that's kind of when their partnership with NOAA started. To understand the Great Lakes and what's going on in the lakes, we need continuous and 
uh, real-time measurements of what's going on in the water, and that's what we're focused on, with sensors that we can put in the water or put on a buoy above the water so that we can make the measurements that we need in order for the scientists to look at it, to understand what's going on, to derive their models from that. A lot of what we're involved in is uh, validating either a model that's being developed here at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, or we're validating a National Weather Service forecast. We're beginning to look at things like keeping those same physical observations, uh, but then moving towards uh, ecosystem observation parameters uh, that are helping us understand how the system is changing, how the biology is changing in the system. Well, right now, our team is, is focused on two um, quite significant issues, uh, one being the harmful algal blooms, which happen annually, um, and the other is uh, hypoxia development, which is also a seasonal phenomenon. Harmful algal blooms are a certain type of algae known as cyanobacteria that produce toxins that are harmful to people, to wildlife. Hypoxia occurs when there's a lot of um, organic material that are accumulating at the bottom of the lake and decomposing. And as it's decomposing, it's sucking up oxygen. It's using up all of the oxygen in the bottom so that you're having um, oxygen depleted waters. Periodically, that hypoxic water gets pushed up against the shoreline, and when the drinking water intakes experience that, the water can be discolored and certain metals can be introduced into the, the water that you don't want in your drinking water intakes. We have buoys stationed at various places, and those guide our models to let us know when conditions are right for upwellings that would move uh, hypoxic water potentially into the vicinity of the drinking water intakes. In recent years, I've been working on developing experimental forecast models for harmful algal blooms and hypoxia in the Great Lakes. So with that information, then we can predict the movement of water that's affected by harmful algal blooms and hypoxia and thereby give some advanced notice of drinking water plants that may be affected by uh, rapid changes in water condition. These are our Titus buoy. We have a satellite tracking device. On top is a anemometer, wind speed and direction, or webcams, ultrasonic wind, barometric pressure. There's a data logger inside. There's a modem that you can see, wave sensors. It's solar powered, temperature string, so we can measure water temperature throughout the entire water column and connect to it anytime we want, check data, upload programs. They're responsible for deploying the buoys, operating them, maintaining them, and then we uh, manage the data in the centralized way so that not only the city of Cleveland or LEADCO can access the data, but uh, all the residents, policymakers, resource managers, um, anyone who has an interest in understanding the condi conditions in Lake Erie has access to the data. By getting advanced warning of when these events are coming, we can effectively change our treatment strategies to address the water quality that we're going to see. That is a huge benefit in the water treatment industry. And the notion behind this program was shouldn't all of these agencies be coordinated in their monitoring activities and also sharing the data with one another so that we can have more robust information products so that a broader group of audiences can access the data and learn from the data. I mean, the National Weather Service, if you talk to them about this buoy network, they'll say, you know, if there's a line of storms heading across Lake Erie, the buoy is the first thing that it's going to hit. So. And we actually have a special data stream set up so they can get real time down to the second wind speed data to watch those storm fronts moving across the lake. Fishermen are using it, freighters will use it, surfers and boaters are using it because it'll give them conditions of the lake uh, and the water temperatures for fishing. We can look at the lake from land, uh, we can figure out where we need to go or where not to go uh, and be able to have a successful day. Well, 75% of my business is out of state. So when the boats stay at the dock, that money goes someplace else instead of here. Weather in the Great Lakes uh, does tend to deteriorate in October and November. Even though the water's warm, the buoy starts to take on ice uh, and it can actually tip over. Then if it's sort of sideways uh, in, in big wave conditions, it can actually just rip it apart. So we're working on ways to try to uh, get them those observations year round. So the way that things have been done in the past 
The researchers will identify a problem, a water quality problem, and they will conduct their research and build a product and then take it to stakeholders and ask them if they see it as something that's useful. Um, but we're looking at the problem and the way that we interact with communities completely differently. We want to begin speaking with uh, community members, stakeholder groups from the get-go to understand what their interests are, what their problems are in dealing with water quality, so that we're working with them to develop solutions. Further funding of this research is imperative for all industries, not just water, but for fisheries and for power plants, for recreation. Uh, tourist dollars are huge. The investment in data is relatively small compared to the benefits that we eventually get from those data in terms of being able to understand and predict how these events are going to occur into the future. There is a time when there is a, a lot more pollution in the water and things look pretty dismal. Well, we've recovered from that and if we don't continue to monitor the lakes and what is going on with them, with what we're doing, we could very easily go back to those conditions. Let's take a moment now to see how meteorologists use the data that comes from the buoys. The data is stored at the National Data Buoy Center and is made available to the world via a web page on the internet. The data is also sent to us here at the National Weather Service where meteorologists can continuously monitor the data as it arrives. The buoy data shows up on the main computer screens that meteorologists use to see the weather around them. The meteorologists can see each buoy and where it is located on a map with the data displayed. Buoy data is also stored in text files that are sent out to the NOAA All Hazards Radio where you can listen to what the buoy is currently reporting and hear the latest forecast. If major changes to the conditions on the body of water that the meteorologist is concerned about occur, the meteorologist can update the forecast. The National Weather Service meteorologist spends most of their day at the office looking over all of the buoy and computer forecast models to generate their own forecast. The buoys play an important role in determining what will happen over the water in the future by telling the computers what is happening right now. This can be compared to watching somebody bake some delicious chocolate chip cookies. Once a cook gathers all of the ingredients, they can begin to bake the cookies. Buoy data is an ingredient in the weather forecast and the computer model forecast is a cookie we get to look at and enjoy later on. Once the forecaster makes a decision on the wind and wave forecast, they can begin to draw pictures every hour to show the wind direction and speed along with wave heights. The National Weather Service is here for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week to monitor the weather not only on the lakes and oceans of this great country of ours, but on land as well. The information the buoys and the National Weather Service provide helps the United States Coast Guard protect our shores and stand ready to rescue swimmers, boaters, and ship crews whenever they are in trouble on our nation's waters. National Weather Service meteorologists take an oath to be a major part in the protection of life and property, including the water that surrounds us. They will continue to ensure people get the latest buoy and forecast information so they can enjoy the beaches, boating, and fishing throughout the years to come. But they need your help by knowing when it is safe and when it is not safe to be on the water. When danger appears on the water, stay safe and stay on shore. So there you have it. I hope I've been able to give you a little understanding of what weather buoys are and how they help all of us to have fun at the beach and also do that safely and on the water in the boat.
as you saw, buoys are very important to make delivery of goods from one place to another safer, along with making sure our drinking water remains safe at all times. But most of all, meteorologists and scientists use this information from the buoys to make future forecasts of wind and wave conditions and to learn more about how the wind makes the water move over time. And so, I hope you enjoyed watching this video and have learned to respect water and do your part to keep the water clean for years to come.